We're absolutely delighted to have Ambassador Ford with us. Um, I'd like to thank uh, both McCormick Company and uh, TCOR Networks for sponsoring this evening's program. It's a wonderful thing they've done. And we thank specifically uh, Lawrence Curzius and John McCormick of McCormick, and uh, we thank uh, Mr. Salkini, Jay Salkini, and uh, uh, Ed Cal uh, Salkini as well. Uh, McCormick has been a member of this council since 1981, during our first program year. They've been an absolutely marvelous supporter of the council over the years, and, and uh, we, we're always glad to, to thank them. And uh, Mr. Salkini has been a supporter of the council in the past, and we hope to see him again in the future. I don't have to remind you the topic of the evening. And uh, nor do I have to say very much about our special guest, the Ambassador of the United States to Syria. Uh, ambassador Ford is a local boy. He lives in Baltimore now. He's a graduate of Johns Hopkins University, Homewood campus, Master of Arts degree from Sice in Washington. He uh, joined the Peace Corps, served in Morocco. He, uh, uh, in the State Department, he's had the, uh, an array of assignments overseas early in his career, including Cameroon and Turkey and Egypt, uh, and uh, has had in his more senior career a series of, I think, most interesting posts. He was, he was the uh, Chief of Mission in Bahrain. He was our ambassador to Algeria. He was in Iraq for several years. While there, he was stationed for a while in the south of Iraq, where the Mahdi army was, not an easy posting, and uh, later served under two of our ambassadors there, as Consul General, first of all, and then as, I think, DCM, under Mr. Negroponte. Uh, it's striking that, and I think memorable, that it was during that time that the uh, Sunnis were enticed into participating in the national elections, and of course, as we all know, the, the importance of trying to get all the major groups uh, in Iraq working somewhat together. But to have them in the ball game was a, a major achievement. Um, now, of course, as you know, he's our ambassador to Syria. As such, he's been a strong supporter of the cause of the uh, activists within the country and those that are struggling against what is seen as a uh, undesirable uh, present regime. The, uh, the question of Syria today is filled with questions. You have hundreds, I know. It's my pleasure to present to you now the United States Ambassador to Syria, Mr. Robert Ford. Well, good evening. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, it allowed me to get home a little earlier from the office than I usually do. So thank you, Frank, for that. Um, and Robbie, thanks to you and to the work that the Council on Foreign Relations here in Baltimore does. And I look forward to rejoining the organization now that I'm back home. Um, it's a terrific honor to be here in uh, Baltimore tonight facing Camden Yards, where our team is in first place. Um, <laughs> O's. Um, I got to remind a Yankees fan of that today. Um, I, I'm going to talk a little about the Arab Spring and what it means and what's happening in the Middle East broadly. Um, I've served in places like Egypt and Bahrain uh, Algeria and Iraq and I want to talk just sort of some broad themes and then I'm going to narrow down to Syria and what's happening and the, the tragedies that are happening there and talk a little about what we're doing 
Um, and then I'd be delighted to take questions. I hope to talk not more than about 20 minutes. I can't imagine anything more dreadful than listening to me drone on for more than about 20 minutes. So, um, but it will help me at the start um, if I had a sense, how many people here have been to the Middle East or been to Syria? Oh, great, excellent, excellent. Um, one little bit of work I have to do as an official of the Department of State, we advise you not to visit Syria right now. <laughs> um, so let me, let me talk first about the Arab Spring. My interpretation is that this is not so much about democracy as it is about dignity. Um, Jay, you will know the word, Atal, you will know the word, karama, not a democratia. It's about karama, first and foremost. Dignity, what do I mean? For many people, I think even most people living in these countries, they don't have the same sense of accountability and authority from the people to the government. What I mean by that is, if the police rough you up, here in Baltimore, that becomes a big scandal. In Egypt, in Iraq, in Tunisia, it was standard operating procedure. And if you wanted to complain, who do you complain to? The police caused the problem in the first place. If you want to set up a business, even just a small business, you usually had to pay a little something, or two times, or three times, to petty bureaucrats. And if you wanted to complain, you go back to the police. And guess what? They don't care. People had to put up with this, not just for a month, this is the way they lived all the time. Now, where did the Arab Spring start? In Tunisia. And do you remember the triggering event? A young man with a college education couldn't find a job, and so he just wanted to sell fruit off of a simple wooden trailer, like an arbor here in Baltimore. He, the, the, he had, to, you had to get a license, because this is not like Reagan economics in the Middle East. Everything, you have to get permits. Um, they insisted on a bribe, just for a guy who wanted to peddle fruit off a cart. And he was so angry that they wouldn't just give him the license that he set himself on fire, immolated himself. This young man's name was Bouazizi. He was about 28 years old, college educated, couldn't start a family, Remember in Arab culture, those of you who have been to the Middle East, you will notice Arab culture, family is everything. You're not really an adult until you have children. Couldn't, this young man couldn't do anything, set himself on fire, ended up dying. Now, where, where did the Arab Spring come from? All these revolts that we've seen on television. Well, the anger about dignity has always been there. But what's new? Internet? satellite TV, and young kids who are really plugged into things like Facebook and YouTube. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In my fancy American ambassador residence in Damascus, which I hope has not been sacked yet, um, I had over 300 Arabic language television stations. Over 300 from some were broadcasting in Arabic out of Europe from places like London and Paris, Italy, Turkey. Um, but most of them were broadcasting from different Arab countries, from places like Dubai, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, lots and lots in Egypt. News has just exploded into Arab families' homes in a way that it didn't before. When I was in the Peace Corps, television news was incredibly boring because it was controlled by the government and they only put on good news. There was never any bad news, never anything about the police beating up some kid and police being held responsible and sent to court. Ha, huh, no way. 
It was boring. People didn't watch it. Now they turn on the news and it's unfiltered. It's uncensored. It's interesting. And so people, I mean, prime time video, I'm sorry, prime time television viewership has exploded. So when that kid in Tunisia set himself on fire, a couple of Arabic satellite news stations like Al Jazeera had it on the news within a day. And remember, these companies compete with each other just like American news companies do. So as soon as one or two companies started, they all started. Remember what I said about the 300 networks. The news about what's going on in the different countries has just exploded. So people in Egypt were watching what was going on in Syria. People in Bahrain were watching what was going on in Tunisia. And they, this was new. This had not happened before. This is, this is very new. Now, second thing is the internet. Some people, the rich families, have home computers, but most people don't. Most people go to the internet cafes, they blog on. But they are, in, those kids over there are so plugged in, they're like way, way, way beyond me. I mean, way beyond me. I had, I gotta be honest, I've never uploaded a video to YouTube. Have you? <laughs> they do. No, really, they do. I have to tell you, I, I thought I better get with it. I better get a Facebook account. Well, these kids are like way beyond that. And these are ways that they can communicate with each other and the government can't stop it. I mean, they're plugged into each other. You know, the secret police could not, absolutely could not control this. They could not control it in Tunisia. They didn't understand it. They could not control it in uh, Egypt. They did not understand it. They could not control it in Syria. They did not understand it. Let me give you an example, two examples. These are true stories. I knew a dissident in Syria, a number of them, and he got arrested. Uh, this was last May. Taken into jail, beaten up, standard operating procedure. The next day he's hauled out of his cell, and there's his backpack and his laptop. And the police, and these were you know, like police privates, they weren't educated people. And they said, we cannot turn on your computer. Show us how. So dissident, turns on his computer, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, it's broken. It is broken? What is the matter? He said, I think I can fix it. He goes to start, open control panel, internet options, delete everything. <laughs> then he gave it to them and he said, I fixed it. <laughs> Similarly, a different dissident who was stopped at a, uh, taken in by the police, said that in front of her, they went through her bag and they said, where is the Facebook? Where is the Facebook? <laughs> I, what, what I'd like you to understand is what's different is that young people there were very plugged in, but the top of the country and the security apparatus, the icky, security apparatus was way behind the curve. And so you could get street demonstrations started and the government was having a hard time controlling it. Now, that was a year ago. I'm gonna fast forward to what's happening today. I'm very sorry, but the Iranian government has helped the Syrian government enormously in terms of not only explaining to them that Facebook is not a book, but that there are ways to monitor the internet. There are ways to check who's getting into Facebook and what they're writing and what they're reading. There are ways to jam people who are trying to upload videos. There are ways to prevent people from using cell phones by jamming those. It's become much, much more difficult for the street protest movement to organize and to operate than it was a year ago. That's, that's going on now. <clears throat> if some of you were watching last week, Secretary Clinton talked about us trying to get communications equipment into Syria to help the opposition. That's what we're doing. We're gonna try to help them reestablish links so that they can reaccess the internet and tell their stories. Because otherwise, 
there's going to be a lot of killing in Syria, and nobody's going to know about it. So that's one of the things we're working on. But I would like to talk a little also about what's happened to that street protest movement and, and what it means. You see the violence, 20 dead, 25 dead. Yesterday, over 100. It's just absolutely appalling. It's atrocious. One of the things that's happening is the street protesters have, in the last year, started to organize themselves. It used to just be you know, people on a block who'd say, let's go demonstrate and look at some signs. And then it was maybe a neighborhood. It's kind of hard to imagine my neighborhood of Bolton Hill getting together for a protest. But in <laughs> neighborhoods of Damascus, they were doing it. Now what has happened is entire neighborhoods have come together on a city level. And they've organized what are called local revolution councils. And these councils are now, they've become very sophisticated. They're way beyond just organizing protests, although they do that. But they also now have budgets. They're collecting money, mainly from expatriate Syrians, from Syrian families that live outside of Syria, but are sending money into Syria. They organize um, food drives, and they distribute food to families who've lost a breadwinner either because the breadwinner was killed or because the breadwinner is in jail. They did, I don't know, did any of you see the CNN show with Arwa Damon about homes in the hospital and how bad it was? Anybody see that a couple weeks ago? I see a few timid hands. Um, people, won't, people in the protest movement and the opposition will not go to regular hospitals because police come in, the secret police come in and pull people out and take them directly to jail, often killing them. So what the street protest movement has done and these local revolution councils have done is they've set up field hospitals, um, again, working with Syrian doctors. Um, sometimes these hospitals are set up in people's living rooms or um, in maybe in a, the back office of a factory or something like that. The secret police, ubiquitous, are always looking for them. So the field hospitals often have to move, so they're like, in this person's house for a few days, and then they move to that person's house over there. I mean, it's, it's a really hard life. One of the things that we are doing um, now is we are starting to send medical supplies to those field hospitals through um, Turkey and through Jordan. Um, but very important work. Um, they are literally saving people's lives, but they don't have nearly the equipment, they don't have nearly the medical supplies that they need. The local revolution councils that I mentioned also are in liaison with armed opposition groups. They're not, they're not organically linked. It's, uh, this is not like the American Revolution where the Continental Army was really part of the, the young American government, but they talk to each other. Um, the local revolution councils are more political. They don't really get into security, but they do talk to each other. So for those of you who are, and I have become one, um, a YouTube addict, if you look at the demonstrations on YouTube, sometimes you will see armed men on the peripheries of the demonstrations as they're going along. And those are there to protect the protesters from the Syrian army, from the Syrian police if they come, because they're very savage if they come into contact with the protesters. Very savage. That's how you get 100 people killed. But these guys on the perimeter will sort of try to keep the police back, keep the army back a little bit until the protesters can run away. Or they will have um, cell phones and they'll say, oops, the army is coming from over here on the right. Everybody go left. So that kind of coordination is also done by these local revolution councils. Um, and then they also have public affairs people. So if you watch television, sometimes you will see them on TV speaking about what's going on in Homs or what's going on in Damascus or Dara someplace. Um, for those of you who read the New York Times, there was a picture the other day of a UN monitor. And he had on one side a guy in a beard um, in a Syrian army uniform. He was the commander of the armed opposition group in Homs. And on the other side of that UN monitor was a guy named Abu Salah, 
Um, the New York Times didn't identify him, but that's who it was. It was Abu Salah, and he's the spokesman for the Homs Revolution Council. So there you had sort of the political side and the, the violence or the military side on either side of the UN. And I'll talk a little about the UN in a minute. <clears throat> the other thing about the street protest movement in addition to developing this kind of managerial administrative capacity is there's more and more attention on media outreach to the outside. And for those of you who read every day about Syria, um, sometimes you'll see reference to local coordination committees. It's not local revolution committees. These are coordination committees. Basically, that is a media outlet that has been started by a woman in Damascus named Razan Zaytune, um, a very courageous woman. I had the, the pleasure of meeting her once, but it was kind of a sneaky secret meeting. I'm not used to acting like a CIA guy. And, but we went out and met her, and she's very brave. She lives underground. She moves around place to place. Um, and they basically collect information. That's the coordination part. They collect information from around the country and then send it outside to Reuters, to Associated Press, to Agence France Press, to the New York Times. Razan's Rolodex is exceptionally impressive. So they're very smart. They understand that, that international pressure is going to be one of the main things they need to get rid of Bashar al-Assad and the Syrian government. Let me talk just for a few more minutes then about the government itself and then what we're doing. First thing, Bashar al-Assad is a, I've met him twice, medical doctor, he's an eye doctor in fact, studied in England and um, speaks fluent English. I mean, if he were here, what you would notice is he's very tall, has a very long neck, and his English is absolutely fluent. And he's very engaging. When you meet him, he's a very nice guy. Um, he doesn't really look like someone with buckets of blood on his hands, but he is. Um, he and his family operate the country like a mafia. Um, I have met at least four Syrian businessmen who told me stories about how someone from Bashar's family would come to them quietly and make them a business offer that they could not refuse in terms of um, sharing ownership of this private company. Um, this is so well known within the American diplomatic service that when I was getting ready to go to Syria, I asked um, an American diplomat who had just come out, I said, well, is there a good book I should read to get up to speed on Syria? And he said, don't bother with a book. Just watch The Sopranos a few times. <laughs> so um, we want, I want to be very clear about this, it is the policy of the President of the United States, Secretary of State, Bashar al-Assad must leave Syria. We cannot restore stability. We cannot restore peace to Syria as long as he stays, he and his family, frankly. And so they have to go. We have been putting enormous pressure on them. And I'll go through some of the ways very quickly. We have isolated them. Um, for example, they wanted to be on the UN Human Rights Commission. What a joke. Um, we stopped that one. Now, there are a lot of countries that supported them, by the way. That, I mean, it sounds like, oh, that was easy. It wasn't. It was actually, we had to go to a lot of countries who are pretty icky on human rights themselves and say, don't vote for Syria. And we got that done. We have managed to get through the United Nations Human Rights Commission a, a, an investigative team that has written several really acid reports about how bad that government is. It's made them look very bad. Most countries have now thrown out the Syrian ambassador from their, from their capitals, including the United States. Um, we are continuing to work to isolate them. And there was a general assembly resolution. There was a general assembly resolution in the United Nations in February that condemned Assad, said that there needs to be a political transition in Syria and the Syrian government needs to stop killing its own people. We helped draft it and it passed by 137 votes, 
137 countries to 14. And the 14 were Russia, China, Cuba, Iran, uh, Belarus, um, some of the real winners in the, in the United Nations. So key point to make to you is that Russia and China, and that's important because they can veto Security Council resolutions. And what we would like to do, and Secretary again talked about this Thursday when she was in Paris, is we would like the United Nations to pass a resolution, the Security Council to pass a resolution preventing the sale of arms to the Syrian government. Preventing the sale of arms to the Syrian government. But the Russians and the Chinese have told us they will not approve that. They will veto it. So we decided to support the idea of sending United Nations monitors into Syria. And so maybe those of you who are following Syria would have noticed that the UN has sent a few monitors in. Uh, the number as of yesterday was, I'm sorry to say, 11. They're supposed to go to 300. Um, may not surprise you that the United Nations has told us it's a little hard to get monitors to agree to go to Syria right now. <laughs> Remember, they're unarmed. They're unarmed, and it is unprecedented to say this. Uh, Susan Rice really drove this home in a point I was in the uh, White House the other day. She said, it is unprecedented for the United Nations to send unarmed observers into a hot war zone. So the, the United Nations is taking a risk here. Uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon um, we hope that the monitors will quickly increase in terms of their numbers and their presence on the ground. We have seen that when they do go to a place in that location, in that location, the violence does drop. The Syrian government stops shelling. The Syrian government finds out, oh, we do have tear gas canisters back here. Why don't we use those instead of the ammunition? Um, the number of fatalities drops. However, if they're not in all the places where the protests are, and there are protests, there are over a hundred protests a day in different places around Syria. I mean, this is a revolution. If the monitors are only in four or five places, the Syrian government hits with the iron fist in the other 95. Again, that's how you get those high casualty counts. So we need the UN to be in much bigger numbers, in many more places to bring that violence down. I, frankly, I have to tell you tonight, we don't know if it's gonna succeed or not. We hope so, but we have to be realistic. Everything that the Syrian government has promised in the past in terms of cooperating, they have broken their word. I, I would be very hard pressed to think of a single commitment that they have kept. Um, first to the Arab League during that monitoring effort in, Jan in December and January, and more recently to the United Nations. When I left the office today, the Syrians were arguing about the nationality of some of the monitors that were coming in and saying, well, we're not gonna let these Europeans in. They vote against us in the United Nations. They don't get a say in this. When the UN sends a monitoring mission, the country that it's going to doesn't pick and choose where they come from. Um, if the monitors don't work, what we hope is that the Russians and the Chinese Instead of listening to the Americans, they will listen to the United Nations and those monitors who say the Syrian government's violence is disproportionate, the Syrian government's violence is outrageous, and finally the Russians and the Chinese will stop vetoing and instead will pass a resolution that would allow us to go forward with an arms embargo. Um, that's what we hope. In the meantime, as I mentioned, we are working more with the opposition we are working to isolate the Syrian government more and more. Um, we have incredibly tough financial sanctions on them. Um, basically, if you here tonight in Baltimore want to send any kind of money or do any kind of transaction with a business in Syria, you can't, unless it's medical supplies. That's about it. Um, we have just banned all business. We've banned the import of products from Syria. Um, we have convinced our European allies to do that. We've convinced the Japanese to do that. 
we've convinced the Canadians they were easy. They agreed right away. Um, we live, I mean, and now we have Arab countries, and it's very unusual for Arab countries to do this, one Arab country against another. The Arab countries have agreed to do it. So we've isolated them. Um, we do not want to see this violence expand. We want to see it contract, either because the monitors are there or because the Syrian government itself realizes it can't win this. The protest movement is too big, and they stop and decide to allow a transition to go forward. I'm going to finish with a story about my visit to Hama last year. And um, I'm, going to sh I'm going to take you inside American diplomacy on the front lines. Um, you will be appalled and demand better from the Congress. Um, went up there because we knew there were large protests. We could see them on the YouTube videos and on the TV news. Um, the Syrian government said, no, you can't go. It's not allowed. So um, we got in one armored car, four of us, and we just didn't exactly ask for permission. We just kind of went. Um, and the point was to show the protesters, who were peaceful, there was no violence in Hama at that time. I want to underline that. There was no violence in Hama at that time. Huge protests, tens of thousands of people, no violence. And we went up there just to say, your right for self-expression, your right to protest peacefully should be respected. And the United States stands behind you in the exercise of those basic human rights. That was the point of the trip. So we snuck into the city, and um, we came to a kind of like a roadblock with a bunch of rubble in the street. And there were about 20 young men with the Arab kafiyas wrapped around their heads, so all you could see were their eyes. My security officer was like, oh my god. And we sort of stopped at the roadblock, and they said, who are you? And roll down your window, who are you? And my security was like, no, no, don't roll down that window. Don't do that. So through the car, we shouted, we're diplomats. We came to see what's happening. And they're like, oh, diplomats, wonderful. Please go through. So we went about 200 yards, and came to another roadblock, more young men, all wrapped up in just the eye, stopped the car, rolled down the window. Well, this time we rolled it down about this much. Who are you? And we said, we're, this time we tried, we're American diplomats. Oh, American diplomats, wonderful, please go through. Welcome, Ahlan Wasalan. We go another, I don't know, couple blocks, another roadblock. And at this point, I said to my defense attache, Colonel Friedenberg, who uh, went with me, said, um, Rob, how do we get to the main square? What's it say on the map? And Rob said, map? I thought you brought the map, ambassador. <laughs> I'm like, I'm the ambassador. I don't do anything. <laughs> so we got to the third one, stopped, and I got out of the car. My security guy's like, don't get out of the car. Got out of the car and asked these young men and airmen. I said, we're American diplomats. Oh, American diplomats, wonderful. I said, can you tell us how to get to the main square in town? He said, uh, well, you go here and turn left and go right. And, and I, I'm not very good with directions. I said, um, is there somebody who could sort of show us? And out of the sky dropped a white pickup truck. I, this is a true story. And he drove up, and they were like, oh, hello, Mohammed. Ah, oh, hello, Ahmed. How are you? Ahmed, could you take these American diplomats, who are too dumb to bring a map, um, <laughs> down to the main square in town? So we followed him and uh, went right through many more roadblocks. And uh, we got to the main square, and we discovered that the whole city was shut because there was a general strike. That hadn't been in the YouTube videos or on the news. And so there was no hotel uh, that was open. All the hotels were closed. And um, there are these four American diplomats in, standing next to a car. And we're standing outside the second hotel to say, no, we're closed. There's a general strike. And there are these four guys sitting under a tree in the shade sitting in these little white plastic chairs that you see everywhere in the Middle East, drinking tea. They're looking at us, and we're looking at them. And uh, one of them said, want some tea? <laughs> we said, don't have a hotel to check in? Sure, we'll have tea. So they, out of nowhere, plastic chairs arrive. One of the things I love about Arab culture is the hospitality. It's just far beyond what you can imagine. Out of nowhere, tea, uh, chairs appear. Tea appears, we're sitting, drinking tea, they're looking at us, we're looking at them. And um, 
they said, one of them asked me, and I'm just in blue jeans and a polo shirt, and he said, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm the American ambassador, and I came to see what was happening. And they said, nah, really, who are you? <laughs> I said, no, really, I'm the American ambassador. And they're like, ah, don't mess with me. Who are you, really? I said, no, I'm really, I'm the American ambassador. And I reached in, gave out business cards. They all went, oh my gosh, they got on their phone. Come here right now, the American ambassador is here. And so instantly, I mean, like in three minutes, the four guys drinking tea had become 20 or 25 people. They, and they weren't pro-American, understand that. What they wanted was, they wanted someone from outside to hear the stories of tyranny that they had suffered. And so I wish, I wish, I wish I had a tape recorder just to have it playing or recording while the government did this to my father 10 years ago. They, they um, arrested him and they took our apartment and threw us on the street. My brother was killed by the police um, six months ago and nobody does anything. Um, they, they won't um, let me start my company over here because they say that I have to pay a huge price. I mean, just story after story after story of the of the, the pain inflicted. It goes back to what I was saying about the dignity. They didn't really talk about democracy. I think they did talk about freedom, and they certainly wanted to be able to speak freely. But I, I understand that democracy, you know, they've never seen a free election. I don't think they can really imagine what a free election is. So they took us, uh, well, to finish the story, so uh, tea, and then they said, um, how about some ice cream? And I said, ice cream would be great. Out comes ice cream. They make very nice, thick, delicious, high, high calorie, creamy ice cream in Syria. It's very famous. So then we had ice cream. We ate it all. Then we kind of looked at us and said, maybe you want lunch. Yeah, lunch would be great. Out comes lunch. Very nice. And Syrian cuisine, as Jay knows, absolutely fabulous. I think it's probably the best in the Arab world, I gotta say. I, I won't tell you what the worst is, that would be undiplomatic, but Syrian is at the top. Um, and then coffee, and then they took us to a hospital where they were treating people who had been shot by the government. Um, and the next, the next day, we, did the, we visited the city again, went around. That's where we got in the middle of a demonstration, which wasn't our intention, but it started an hour early, and we bumbled into it. Um, it's the only thing in my life I've seen start an hour early in an Arab country. Um, but it did. So the government was so angry at us about that visit. Um, they sent about 500 of their goonish thugs who attacked our embassy uh, three days later. Um, and they accused us of uh, smuggling in arms. Um, in fact, we had no arms, and which my security guy is still mad about. And um, it was just ridiculous. So I'm gonna close with the response from those people in Hama when they heard the, the government accusations that we had smuggled arms. Remember, they had just talked to us and there was no violence or no weapons. So a video appeared on YouTube, which um, it was in Arabic, but I'll explain to you. It shows a very old washing machine, the kind my grandmother in Oklahoma had, and it's circular and it's white, and it just kind of, the agitator just kind of goes kerchunk, 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 kerchunk. And on top of this old washing machine agitator, there was a TV satellite dish just plopped on it. And so as the agitator moved around, kerchunk, kerchunk, the satellite dish moved around, kerchunk, kerchunk, kerchunk. And there was a sign on it, and it said, in Arabic, it said, Hadiyah, the gift from the American ambassador to the people of Hama. And a voice came on and said, Ahmed, what is this? And Ahmed answers, this is the secret gift of the American ambassador. And he said, it, it's great, what is it? Ahmed says, it, it is their latest technology. It cost one-fourth of the American budget. Wonderful, but what does it do? Kerchunk, kerchunk, kerchunk. It can seek out and destroy enemy jet airplanes. Kerchunk, kerchunk. 
It can seek out and destroy enemy tanks. And at the end of the battle, it will wash your clothes. It's true. It's true. I liked that so much we put it on our Facebook page for the embassy. Um, what I would ask of you is to think about those kids who in the middle of this tyranny and this fear and this repression still have a sense of humor and still have a sense of what's possible. And I would ask you to help us help them. So thank you very much. Sorry, no, no, please. By the way, there are two microphones, one in either aisle, and if you'd ask your questions from those, we won't have to repeat them. If, however, you do ask a question from the audience, I, I will have to repeat it. Do you have any sense of what the foreign policy objectives would be if the opposition in Syria comes to power? Good question. Yeah. Um, actually, we've, we've asked people from the opposition that question in the local revolution councils, which I think will be the, the key driving force. Um, I think they will still want the Golan Heights back from Israel. I don't think there's any question of that. Um, they will really hate Iran for what the Iranians have done. They burn Iranian flags now in the demonstrations. Um, Hezbollah, the Lebanese terrorist group that the current Syrian government helps and the Iranians help, they hate Hezbollah too because it also is helping put down, trying to put down the street protest movement. They're burning Hezbollah flights as well. I think they will be favorably disposed to the United States, um, but they're angry at us that we haven't sent NATO airplanes in oh, to attack the government. So sense. I mean, they, they're not as, how would I put it, they're not as friendly as they were back in July last year when I met, because they think we should be doing more right now. Well, so, they will be pro-Western, but they will not be gushing pro-Western. Oh, and they'll be really mad at Russia and China, too. Mr. Ambassador, uh, Fraud uh, Ajami had an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. Uh, did you have the opportunity to read it? I did. Okay, so um, he, it was entitled that the uh, Obama administration had abdicated its responsibility mm -hmm. uh, uh, to Syria. Um, I'm sure you disagree with it, but what do you say to his suggestions for arming the opposition in a no-fly zone and taking more of an active role like we did in Libya. Yeah. A couple of things on that. Um, first, thank you. And Professor Ajami was my professor at SAIS. I won't embarrass him or me by saying how long ago. Um, we have not in any way abdicated responsibility for what has gone on in Syria. Um, I have frankly never seen us exert such non military, say that again, never seen us exert such non-military pressure on any country, including Iran. Um, I talked about the financial sanctions. I talked about the efforts for diplomatic isolation, the success we've had in the United Nations outside the Security Council. Um, the Syrian government is very much under siege. What has not happened is the Syrian government has not given up. and. To the argument that those people make, uh, that some people like Professor Ajami make, that, well, then we need to use military force. I, would, I have two cautionary notes to that. The first is like a safe zone, a buffer zone. Uh, how long? How long? The buffer zone that we had in, at the end of the Kuwait war when Saddam Hussein was attacking Kurds and we set up a safe zone in northern Iraq. That lasted 12 years. I'm not kidding. And it only ended, it only ended when George Bush made the decision to go all the way to Baghdad and take out Saddam Hussein. That's, that's the only, otherwise it would have been more than 12 years. So I think 
to have an informed debate about the buffer zone. We need to put the cards on the table. And the, to me, one of the main cards is, is the American public ready to sign on to a military commitment no. in conjunction with no. Turkey, sure, no. in conjunction maybe with Jordan, sure, but are we willing to deploy our men and women indefinitely to protect a safe zone? I mean, that's an issue. I, I'm not going to answer that tonight. I just think this is something that we're now starting to look at in Washington, but this is a question. Um, then the second question is, if you say, for example, give arms to these armed groups, and I've talked about them a little bit, um, two things. In Libya, we armed them, and what's happening on the ground in Libya right now? A very shaky government in Tripoli, and armed groups who used to be fighting on the same side are now fighting each other. And so there are gun battles, even in the Libyan capital, Tripoli, there are gun battles in several of the cities of Libya, and the government's hold is very tenuous because these armed groups, nobody really controls them. If we were to arm them, we could figure out a way to do it, but if we were to arm them and the government falls, what comes after? What comes after? Are these armed groups all gonna suddenly say, well, we're glad that's over, we're gonna go home now. Who's gonna run the country? There is not yet, unlike Libya, there is not yet a political plan among Syrians on how to go forward. The Libyans had that. The Syrians, unfortunately, do not yet. And I will not hide from you that it's something I personally constantly push, nag, cajole Syrian opposition people I meet to, to move on this, to get going on it. Um, I can report to you they have a draft. Um, I can report to you that it's not bad. It's about an honest, I would give it a B. I can report to you it hasn't evolved a bit since December. Gotta go, gotta move. The answer is not military strikes by themselves. The answer is some kind of a political transition, which is what President Obama has been talking about. Otherwise, we just go from one kind of fighting to a different kind of fighting. So that's what I would. Oh, and then there's, I mean, there's the legality argument as well, which is that we do not, unlike Libya, we do not have a United Nations Security Council resolution. So with all due respect to my former professor, I spent more time in Iraq than he did. <laughs> uh, that may not be a sign of smarts, but nobody said you had to be smart to get up to the high level of the State Department. You mentioned the support that the government of Iran is giving to the Assad government in Syria. My question is, how can, well, it's a two-part question, but how concerned is the, when you, when you say the Iranian government is that if Assad falls in Syria, that, that's, that that may inspire another wave of protests in Iran? And the second part is, in your opinion, how concerned should they be? Hmm. I'm gonna have to dodge the second part of the question because I'm just, I, I can't judge how volatile the situation in Iran is. But what I can tell you is, um, again, these satellite television stations in the Middle East and in the Arab world, we know that some people in Iran are watching what's happening in Syria. I mean, they're watching the street protest movement and there's sympathy, we have heard, towards what the Syrians are trying to do among many Iranians. But you know, Iran had a big street protest movement itself in 2009, and they drew out tens of thousands of people. I was in Iraq at the time watching it on television, um, and slowly, steadily, the Iranian government ground it down. And I think in the process learned some lessons about how to do things like break into people's Facebook accounts and, and monitor internet activity. Um, so I think the Iranian government is nervous about this, um, whether or not it's going to lead to new outbreaks of political unrest in Iran. I, I'm just not in a position to say. I'm sorry. In my opinion, I don't believe that either the Russians or the Chinese believe that governments govern with the consent of the governed. Mm -hmm. Given that belief of mine, which I think others may share, how, how can we assume that the UN Security Council will ever pass any sort of a meaningful resolution without vetoes from these two countries. Yeah. 
No, that's a fair question. Um, because they are very embarrassed to have to constantly veto. Russian flags have been burned after these vetoes from Morocco to Cairo to the Gulf. Chinese flags have been burned all across the Arab world. Remember these TV stations I was talking about? The opinion polling that we're doing um, and that Arab uh, opinion poll uh, centers are doing show that Bashar al-Assad, who used to poll at the very top, most popular leader in the Arab world, has now plummeted to the very bottom. There's huge sympathy in places like Morocco and Cairo for what the Syrians are trying to do. There's huge sympathy in places like Saudi Arabia and Doha and Qatar. And so for the Russians and the Chinese to veto again, they will lose a lot in terms of their own influence and in terms of any goodwill they have in other Arab countries, not to mention countries outside the Arab world. I don't think they want to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm, the people who supported the Arab League monitor mission the most were the Russians and the Chinese. If you listen to what Susan Rice said about this, last Thursday and Friday, you will have noticed that we took a somewhat cautious approach. But the Russians were gung-ho. Um, in fact, they insisted there be a vote within 36 hours. They really want that monitor mission to succeed. They don't want to have to do another veto. It's not to say they wouldn't, but they would rather, they don't want to be put in the dilemma of choosing. I'd be interested in your insights when it comes to uh, sort of a regional engagement in terms of Turkey. What do you see s the red lines for Turkish enge engagement in that region? Like, what, what will it take for them in order to engage, I think, engage in order to, to sort of to, uh, to counter the, the Syrian military's activities in the region? Um, if I were to ask you, shall we cut to the chase, are you asking how, what would it take for the Turkish military to No, not, not, not necessarily the Turkish military, but maybe the Turkish government to put more pressure on the Syrian government. I don't, I don't know the, their level of engagement. Yeah. Well, the, actually, um, with us kind of lobbying, um, <laughs> they have done quite a bit, actually. Um, and they, frankly, it was not a hard sell. Uh, they have themselves put on a very tough set of financial measures. Um, they no longer will work with the Syrian Central Bank, which has really shrunk trade. Um, they have banned uh, the sale of weapons, for example. Um, they're much tighter on visas. Um, they've put in a pretty strong set of sanctions themselves. They have now about 24,000. The number I saw today was 23,800. 23,800 Syrian refugees in little camps on the Turkish side of the border, usually maybe a mile or two miles inside the border. The Turks, I think, are very uncomfortable with this because they remember what happened after the Kuwait War when Saddam Hussein drove hundreds of thousands of Kurds into Turkey. And I think they do not want a repeat of that experience this time in Syria. They have signaled that uh, very clearly. So at the same time, they don't want the Syrian state to melt down and the place to become like Somalia or like Iraq in 2003, 2004, where we have a lot of you know, battles going on around the country. That would feed instability and it wouldn't be so hard in a country in chaos like that for weapons then to be smuggled back into Turkey. So they need to have a stable government. The Turks have concluded, if I may speak on their behalf this once, the Turks have concluded that the Bashar al-Assad regime will not and cannot restore stability to the country. And so he needs to go. And they've been very forceful about saying, as we have, that Bashar al-Assad has to go. I don't think you're going to see a military action until they have a more immediate large-scale refugee problem, for example. Or if Turks shelled, um, I'm sorry, the Syrians shelled a refugee camp inside Turkey two weeks ago. I would think if the Syrians do that a few more times, that might also trigger a Turkish response. One of the things that we will probably do is raise Turkey and the Syria problem inside NATO. Um, I would expect that in the next week or two. I'm from Syria. I was 
born and raised in homes. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is go back to the uh, monitors, international monitors that in Syria right now. Their mission is very poorly defined. I don't know what is their objective. And what is the end point? In three months from now, what is going to be their final report? Is it uh, they're going to say in the report, oh, here we go, the, 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 the killing is down, uh, things much better since we got there. The Russian then will say, let's give him another 90 days or three months. And guess what? In three or six months from now, there will be not, not too many Syrians in the street mm -hmm. demonstrating because the government is killing them. They are in, in prison, it's even though the, the killing, the number of killing down, but look at the prison. They are now putting more people in the prison mm -hmm. than killing them. So yes. it's in three months, for six months from now, there will be nobody in the street to demonstrate. Yeah. Um, well, the government's brutality is, is atrocious. The point of the monitors is actually to help a political process start. The, there is a United Nations plan, which we voted in favor of in the Security Council. So did the Russians, so did the Chinese. We all voted for it. The United Nations plan says first a ceasefire, then the government allows peaceful protests, peaceful protests. The government releases the thousands and thousands. I, I'm not sure, we don't know exactly how many, but we think there may be as many as 20 to 30,000 political prisoners in Syria right now. I have to release those people, and then there would begin a dialogue and a negotiation between the opposition and the Syrian government, which would lead to the political transition that I was talking about. That's the United Nations plan. The monitors are simply there to say, did the government respect, or did the opposition respect the top part of this program of no shelling of cities, not shooting at peaceful protesters, removing army forces from cities. That's what the monitors are there to do. And they're simply there to be witnesses and to tell the world, well, tell the Security Council, and we'll tell the world, um, what's happening on the ground. They're supposed to be a neutral, reliable set of eyes on the ground. Now, what I will say is, and one of the reasons we voted for this, because we're very skeptical about the government's willingness to keep any commitments. We did notice when the Arab League had monitors in December and January, anywhere the monitors went, the Syrian government was afraid to shell and shoot people with the same brutality they do when it's just them. Um, the number of fatalities in any place the Arab monitors went immediately dropped. So we, one of the reasons we supported sending these UN monitors was just to bring down the bloodshed in places like your city of Holmes. Um, and I think they've had mixed success. When they're on the ground, it does seem to happen. The problem is there are not enough of them and they don't stay very long, which is why we need many more. Our time is up for questions. We'll have to end the session uh, with an enormous debt of gratitude to our speaker. Oh. Well, thank you.